everlasting Father, gracious Yahuwah Abba, what a great privilege it is to call you as our Abba, our Father Yahuwah who loves us. Yes. Witness your people today. We are filled with thanksgiving because we acknowledge and recognize the work of your mighty hands, sustaining and guiding each and every one of us. Thank you for assembling us together today. You know the purpose of our gathering. It is to praise and to glorify you as we observe the Moedim. Father, we firmly believe as we rehearse these appointed times, you were glorified in heaven. Because it declares have faith in you yes. and the work of your gospel. Mm -hmm. Father, please be with us now yes. as we bring ourselves to you yes. as a living sacrifice. Without you, we are nothing. Yes. Because of you, we have purpose. Yes. There is joy within us. Yes. Because you love and care for your people. Uh -huh. Accept now the praise of your servants, including our supplications. Our King Yahusha, it is because of you, your sacrifice, and what you did on the cross, that because of this, we can now approach the Father. Uh -huh. May you be with us today. As we observe the seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we will recall again your sacrifice and the purpose and meaning behind this Moedim. Please cleanse us of our sins. Forgive completely our iniquities as you have done on the cross. We firmly believe. Though our sins are crimson red, they are white as snow. Father, please bless your people here, especially those who will receive baptism. Yes. This would be a special day for them yes. because they will be brought into your kingdom. Father, as they listen to your holy words, prepare their minds and their hearts. We beseech you on this special occasion when they are immersed into the water. May you please prepare their hearts and minds yes. to receive the power of your Holy Spirit. Uh -huh. Be with us as we study your holy words. Send forth your Holy Spirit once again yes. to give us peace that we need. Consolation coming from your everlasting arms. Uh -huh. May you bless and accept the offerings, the sacrifices of your people. Yes. May you continue to bless the livelihoods of each and every one of us. Yes that we can continue to go on and complete our journey of faith. We believe, Father, you have listened to our prayers. Yes. You have blessed your people throughout the world yes. as we assemble together as one people to worship you forevermore. Amen. We ask everything, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom to everyone, gracious be to our loving Father, that again we are assembled together, not only to celebrate Shabbat today, but also to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We all know the purpose of the feast, 
They're called moedim or appointed times of our father. They're appointed times because they represent the work of our king, Yahusha HaMashiach, as he carries out his work of salvation called the gospel that we might be redeemed and eventually restored as we receive life everlasting. And so as we wait for that appointed day, when we shall be redeemed fully at last, we rehearse our faith just like Abraham rehearsed his faith when he went to the promised land. And so in the rehearsal of our faith, it is important that we understand the meaning, the purpose behind the rehearsals or convocations that we uphold as the people of God. Last Sunday, we observed the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And if you still remember, there was a reason why we fulfill this specific feast following the Passover event. If you still remember, in the book of Exodus chapter 12, verse 17, Bible tells us to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Last week, we talked about the importance of not eating leaven. Bible says you shall not eat, you shall not eat nothing leaven in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. Now we know the application behind this. Leaven represents what? If you still remember the lesson, what does it represent? Sin, specifically the sin of pride. And so we are called upon by Yahuwah to exercise our faith, to remind ourselves we need to remove the influence of sin in our life. You see, on the cross, Yahusha died for our sins. It is but right that we will do everything we can to overcome now the influence of sin in our life. However, there's also another aspect, something we need to also remember concerning the celebration of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. As you can see on the slide, Bible tells us, on this day, I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. And so we are also to remember what Yahuwah did for his people Israel when Yahuwah delivered them from Egypt. And so what do we do on the seventh day? Because today... It's the seventh day, right, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So what are we called to do on the seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Let's read the book of Exodus 13, 8 down to 10. On the seventh day, you must explain to your children. I want to pause here for a while. How many here have children? Yeah, I think all of us have children. But in the event you do not have children, doesn't matter. The point is, there's something we ought to be remembering, something that we ought to be celebrating that we need to pass from generation to generation. What is that? On the seventh day, you must explain to your children, I am celebrating what Yahuwah did for me when I left Egypt. This annual festival will be a visible sign to you, like a mark branded on your hand or your forehead. Let it remind you always to recite this teaching of Yahuwah with a strong hand. Yahuwah rescued you from Egypt. So observe the decree of this festival at the appointed time each year. What are we to celebrate? Bible says on the seventh day, there's something we ought to be doing. What is that? It says, I am celebrating what Yahuwah did for me when I left. Egypt, this is what we need to communicate. There's a reason why we have an assembly today. The seventh day convocation is to remember what Yahuwah Abba did for his people, Israel. What he did when the Israelites left Egypt. So how can we properly celebrate and commemorate that? Bible says, let it remind you always to recite this teaching of Yahuwah. And so there's a teaching that we need to remember and recite because when we do so, it glorifies our Father in heaven. What exactly is that? That we ought to be reciting, that we ought to be remembering, that we need to be thankful for. Bible says, with a strong hand, Yahuwah rescued you from Egypt. This is what we need to remember. The strong hand of Yahuwah Abba. How many here 
know what the strong hand of Yahuwah is? Raise your hand if you know the answer. What's the strong hand of Yahuwah? What does that represent? Anyone here know? The strong hand of Yahuwah? What is it, Sister Carrie? His Ten Commandments. You're close. Because of the strong hand of Yahuwah, he did craft the Ten Commandments. What does that represent? The hand of Yahuwah. What does the hand signify? The right hand, especially. The strong hand, what does it represent? The power, right? The power of Yahuwah. The power of of God. You see, we need to understand what the hand of Yahuwah Abba represents because that is the purpose for why we are gathered today, right? And so the question is, what must we remember about the power or the strong hand of Yahuwah Abba? You have to re remember after the Passover event, when death passed over the households of Israel, what happened to the people of Israel? Pharaoh says to them, go ahead, leave this place. They were in Goshen. They were living in Goshen at that time. And when Pharaoh said, enough is enough, go ahead and go. And so the people of Israel left Goshen. However, the place where they were go going to go to was called the wilderness or the desert. Do you know what the wilderness or the desert represents? What does it represent? Represents danger, uncertainty. You have to keep in mind all of their lives, they were within the walls of Egypt. They knew about the prosperity of Egypt. Yes, there were slaves, but they still have dwelling units. Now they're going to leave this place. And all they knew about was this place. And they're going to go through a place they've never been to. They've never been out of Goshen before, except for Moses. Right Now they're going to go to this wilderness, this nothingness. And out there, they had no idea what to expect. That's a big problem to deal with, right? Especially if you're Moses and you're leading, it, you're leading the people of Israel. Can you imagine 600,000 men, 21 and above? And you have all the others that would make for about millions, two or three million people that Moses is leading across the wilderness. So what... Did they need? They needed the hand of Yahuwah. And so what does the hand of God represent? Let's read the book of Exodus 13, 20 to 22. The Israelites left Sukkoth and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. Yahuwah went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud. And he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. And Yahuwah did not remove the pillar of cloud or pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. And so by the hand of Yahuwah Abba, what did he do for the sake of his people Israel as they left Egypt? Bible says by his hand, Yahuwah guided them with a pillar of cloud. Yahuwah provided a light at night with a pillar of fire. Because we know back then they had no GPS. They had no idea where they were going to go to. There were no maps during that time. Nobody knew the wilderness. Nobody knew what to expect. God knows that. And so he provides guidance. You see, Yahuwah, as our God, he uses his hand to guide us, to direct us where we need to go. All they had to follow was the light. All they had to follow was the pillar of fire, right? God was telling them where to go. That's all they need to do. Follow where God takes them. And so they were fleeing Egypt on their way to the promised land. While they were doing so, what happened? Let's read Exodus 14, 5 down to 7. When word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds. What have we done? Letting all those Israelite slaves get away. They asked. So Pharaoh harnessed his chariot and called up his troops. He took with him 600 of Egypt's best chariots, along with the rest of the chariots of Egypt, each with its commander. And so after Pharaoh says, 
You can go now, Moses. Take all of Israel with you. We don't want to have anything to do with them anymore. And so as they fled, somebody changes their mind. Who changes his mind? Pharaoh. He's saying to himself and his people, what have we done? We just lost our manpower. Who's going to build the pyramids for us? Right? We just lost these slaves. What are the other enemies of Egypt going to think? We're pushovers. And so they had a change of mind. Wait a minute. Maybe that was not such a wise decision. Let's do this. Let's go chase them with the best of our military might. And let's kill all of them to send a message to the world. You better not be messing with Egypt. Right? That's what they wanted to do. And so what do they do? They take their best chariots, 600 of their best chariots, and they chase down the Israelites. And so when you have chariots and you're chasing millions of people, mostly elderly and young children, you're going to catch up within a matter of time, right? It's not an easy chase. It's not a, it's not a hard chase. It's easy for these chariots because they're helpless slaves. They don't know how to fight war. They grew up slaves. You have elderly, sickly women, the children. They're really defenseless against these chariots. And so they run after the people of Israel. And so when they hear the footsteps, what happened? Let's read verse 9. The Egyptians chased after them with all the forces in Pharaoh's army, all his horses and chariots, his charioteers and his troops. The Egyptians caught up with the people of Israel as they were camped beside the shore near Pihahiroth across from Baal. Zephon. And so they were able to catch up with the people of Israel. And they were kind of stuck because this place near Pihahiroth uh, and Baal Zephon, that was near what we call what sea? The Red Sea. So what are they going to do? They have the Red Sea in front of them. They can't cross that. They can't swim all the way across the Red Sea, right? They can't go backwards because who's going to come from there? The army. And so the army is closing in against Israel. And so what would the people of Israel might have been thinking? Moses, what have you done? <laughs> right? Because they're thinking now we guide, we were guided by the pillar of light. We were guided by the pillar of clouds. We followed what Yahuwah wanted us to do. And now we're stuck. Yahuwah took us in front of the Red Sea. You know, sometimes, beloved brethren, next slide, Yahuwah, he often leads us to situations in our life that we never expected. Has that ever happened to you before? You know, you're saying, you know, I'm doing my best to follow the will of Yahuwah. But then why did he take me to this place? Remember Abraham? Abraham? Yeah. When he was Abram, he was living in the Ur, the, the Chaldeans. He was a pagan. Yahuwah says to Abram, I want you to leave your homeland and follow me. To go to the land that I will show you. Right? Does he obey? Yeah, he obeys. You know what happens when he arrives at the promised land? You know what happened? There was a famine. <laughs> the famine was so bad. What did they have to do? They had to go to Egypt to get food. And so they were probably thinking, what on earth would Yahuwah tell me to leave this comfortable place I have with all my relatives, with all the food and servants I have here in Ur, and then go to the promised land in Canaan. And when I get there, there's no food. So what are you thinking? Can I really trust Yahuwah, can I really trust God? I mean, I followed him. He takes me to this place. No, I don't know what to do. You know, sometimes because of our limited wisdom, we often say to ourselves, why did Yahuwah allow this to happen? Have you said something like that before? Sometimes we are placed in situations we can't figure out. People of Israel were in that same situation. They can't figure out why would Yahuwah lead us to the Red Sea, and now we're stuck. But we know there's always a purpose in everything. God does. 
We can't figure it out all at once, but in retrospect, we figure it out. So what's the best thing to do when we are facing these kinds of situations? Well, what happened to the people of Israel when this happened to them? Let's read Exodus 14, 10 to 12. As Pharaoh approached the people of Israel, looked up, and what did they do? They panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to Yahuwah, and they said to Moses, why did you bring us here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. What can you sense in the heart and minds of the people of Israel? Not only did they panic, they were desperate, right? Their panic brought about desperation. And sometimes in life, when bad things begin to happen, we begin to panic. That causes us to be desperate. People of Israel were in desperate. We can understand why. I mean, put yourselves in their situation. You have your kids with you. You follow Moses. You follow the pillar of light. And all of a sudden, you're stuck. And you have the army about to slay all of you. Of course, you're going to feel desperation. That's what they felt. But you know what? There's a reason why sometimes Yahuwah takes us to a place of desperation. There's something he wants to teach us. What do you think that is? When Yahuwah God places you in a place of desperation, what do you think he wants to teach you? Yes, Sister Telma. Troubles are opportunities to learn. Trust. Because when you think about the word trust, something that you cannot learn reading a book. You can't read a book and learn trust. You can learn about trust. But for you to truly learn trust, you need to be in desperation. And so how do you learn trust in times of desperation? Trust is about holding on to Yahuwah, especially in times of trouble. And so when Yahuwah takes them in front of the Red Sea, and, he, and the Egyptian army is about to attack and kill them all, that's a desperate situation, which is also an opportunity to learn trust. This is why, what does Moses say to them? Exodus 14, 13 to 14. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch Yahuwah rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. Yahuwah himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. What was the message of Moses to the people of Israel during times of desperation and trouble? He says, don't be afraid. You know how many times Yahuwah God mentions or says to his people, don't be afraid? Many times. I love that number. <laughs> Hundreds of times. I love that number too. He often says that word. The most repeated command in the Holy Bible is the command, do not be afraid. He's commanding that to us now. Because what's happening throughout the world? What do we notice throughout the world? <laughs> yeah, everything is kind of going badly. Corrupt, right? Violence, danger everywhere. The message Back then, it's the same message today. Do not be afraid. What must we do instead? Have faith. Have trust. Learn trust. And a manifestation of learning trust is to stay calm and hope with expectation. Yahuwah is going to fight for us. And so that's what he wants us to learn. That's what Yahuwah wants us to practice. Living with trust in him. And so what happened after Moses says, be calm, do not be afraid. Exodus 14, 19 to 20. Then the angel of God, who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. The, clo the cloud settled between the Egyptian and the Israelite camps. As darkness fell, the cloud turned into fire, lighting up the night. But the Egyptians and Israelites 
did not approach each other all night. And so what did Yahuwah do? So that his people, Israel, would be protected because of the advancing army. He used an angel of God. And so this angel of God manifested a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. And it stood between them and Israel. And so it was like a barrier. Who created this barrier? The angel of Yahuwah. You know, all of us, we all have an angel. Did you know that? We have a guardian angel that Yahuwah God appoints to us. And their purpose is to minister to us. You can read all about that in the book of Hebrews. The true people of God, every single one of them, they have an angel. There's an angel watching you right now. Did you know that? Yeah. Have you met your angel? <laughs> you probably did not. But there are such things as angels. What do they do? They protect the elect. They protect the people of God. Just like what this angel did. And when it comes to angels, boy, oh boy, they're very powerful. Right? One angel can kill 186,000 men at once. One angel. This one angel prevented the whole Egyptian army from advancing so that they would be at a distance between them and the Israelites. And so the angel of God protected them with a barrier. Yahuwah God sustained the protection of his people. But at the right time, Yahuwah said to the angel, okay, let them go. <laughs> Do you know why? Take a look. Next slide. I think you all know this story. 21-22. Then Moses raised his hand over the sea, and Yahuwah opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. What did Yahuwah do? So that he can deliver his people Israel from the Egyptian army. He did or performed what we call a miracle. You know, Bible scholars who study this passage, they try to give different natural explanations about what happened when the people of God exited across the Red Sea. They said it was an earthquake. They said it was a tide. They said it was just a small river. It wasn't really a river. It, it wasn't really an ocean or a sea. It was really just like a puddle of water. Right? And then the wind was able to cause it to become dry. But when you look at the passage itself and understand what it means, and the song that came after it, you know this is not a natural phenomenon. Well, what do we call this? A miracle. Look what the Bible says. They walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. And so this was the parting of the Red Sea. You see, the hand of God that guided the people of Israel was the same hand of God that parted the Red Sea. Now we understand why Yahuwah God took them there in the first place. Before, they, can't, they couldn't really fully understand. Why did God take us here? Now we know why. He wanted to show his people Israel what his hand is able to accomplish, right? Next slide. Troubles, always remember. Troubles today, like troubles back then, there are always opportunities for Yahuwah's miracles to be revealed in our life. We need to learn to trust. We need to learn to trust and place our faith in Yahuwah Abba. That's what happened to Israel. Exodus 14, 31. When people of Israel saw the mighty power that Yahuwah had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in Yahuwah and in his servant, Moses. Beloved brethren, now we know the reason why Yahuwah God led them there. Number one, it would be very easy to get rid of all the enemies in one swoop, right? You gather them together and swoop, the enemies are gone. Number two, to show and display the awesome power of Yahuwah. With his hand, he parted the red. See, you cannot do that using human means. This is a supernatural act of the Father, Yahuwah. And so because of this, it produced within the people of Israel awe. This is something we need to remember as something that only God can do. 
Only God can do awesome works. What he did was a miracle. And the purpose of why he does these things is to help us place our trust, our hope, and our faith in him. This is why when we think of the hand of God, beloved brethren, Yahuwah delivers his people with his mighty hand of power, right? And one of the ways he, he does so is by guiding us. Yahuwah guides. Wait a minute. He guided them to the Red Sea. They were perplexed. Why did Yahuwah do this? That's because not only does Yahuwah guide, he also sustains and delivers. This is why he sustained them with the pillar of clouds and the angel of God. And he delivered them with his mighty hand because he parted the Red Sea. Do you know what we learn about the hand of God? Simply this. Yahuwah demonstrated his name before the people of Israel. Because at this time, if you look at the next slide, at this time, Yahuwah God introduces to Moses the meaning of his name. Remember what he said about his name? Ahaya, Ashar, Ahaya, which means I am who? I am. What does that mean? Out of nothing, he caused all things to exist. That's the hand of God. That's the power of God. And so when he parted the Red Sea, he showed the people of Israel a demonstration of the meaning of his name. Asher, Ahaya, Asher, Ahaya. I am who I am. His power is unlimited. He can do the impossible because the power that created all things out of nothing is the same power that allowed him to cross the Red Sea. And so now we understand that's the meaning of the name Yahuwah. It's powerful. There's power in God's name. There's power in God's hand. However, what happened to the people of Israel even after a demonstration of his power? Did they fall in line and say, oh, we want to worship Yahuwah now. We know what happened to them. Just several days later, they complained again. They even created a golden calf and Moses Spent 40 days and nights on Mount Sinai. Not only that, again and again, what would they do? They would worship other gods and forget all about Yahuwah. And so quickly they forgot the power or the hand of God. This is why God tells them, okay, once a year, remember my hand. Once a year, remember the power of my hand, how I'm able to deliver. Because there's a tendency among us human beings to forget what God does for us. Right? This is why we need the appointed times. We need to celebrate, to remember what Yahuwah God has done. So despite what Yahuwah did, his people Israel became stubborn, rebellious, and worked, and worked against God. Which is why the hand of power became a hand of discipline and judgment. Right? Instead of a hand of blessing, a hand of provision, a hand of guidance, a hand of sustenance, it became the hand of discipline, the hand of judgment. But he doesn't forget his covenant. That's why even though he shows his mighty hand, it's also something that we need to remember concerning how the people of Israel were delivered out of Egypt. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy. I want you to notice something here. Or did God ever try to go and take for himself a nation from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and by great terrors according to all that Yahuwah your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Yahuwah used his hand, which represents his power, but despite a demonstration of his power, the people of God did not remain faithful to him. It's a good thing. Yahuwah doesn't lash out and punish us according to how we, what we deserve. Yahuwah is long-suffering. That's why he has an outstretched arm. I mean, think about it. Do you know what it means to stretch out your arm? He's extending his effort. He's showing mercy and love to his people, Israel. This is why when Yahuwah stretches out his arm, what is that? When you stretch out your arm before your boy, 
before your girl? What do you want to do when you stretch out your arm? <laughs> what do you want to do? If I do this to you, what do you do? You run away? If I do this, you run away. But if you do this, you stretch out your arm, what do you do? You welcome them. Come to me, right? Bible says he delivered his people Israel, not just with his mighty hand, but also with his long-suffering. His long-suffering, his outstretched arms. This is why in the book of Psalms, 136, verse 12, with a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. And so Yahuwah, when he delivered his people Israel with his power, he also delivered his people with his love. Because if it were not for the love of Yahuwah, they would be done for. They'd be ashes, right? They'd be nothing. But because of his love, Yahuwah relents. I'm not going to punish Israel because I love them. And so he relents. He showed his love when he stretched out his arm. He loves us that much. But today, do you know what that outstretched arm of Yahuwah looks like? Remember, Yahuwah, I am who I am. The hand of God, power of God. But the outstretched arm of God is also manifested in another name. What do you think the outstretched arm of Yahuwah is manifested during our time today? What do you think? Yes, the name Yahusha, right? What does the name Yahusha mean? Yahuwah saves. And so the name Yahusha was given to him because of his work and his purpose. And that was to die sacrificially for our sins. Which means Yahuwah had to give up or sacrifice his son. His son. His only begotten beloved son he would have to give up for our sake. That's why Yahusha is Yahuwah's expression of love. His outstretched arm. Yahusha also loves us. Because for our sins to be forgiven, he had to be nailed on with outstretched arms. He had to stretch out his arms so that we can approach him and he can embrace us. Yahusha is the manifestation of the outstretched arm of God, the love of our King Yahusha. This is why Yahuwah sent his son. We're celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread, not just to observe the hand of God that delivered the people of Israel, but also the, the love, the hand of God and the outstretched arm of God that saved us today because Yahuwah God appointed His Son to be our Savior. And how would our King Yahusha carry out this work of salvation? Through the Moedim. What does the word Moedim again mean? Appointed time. In other words, at this appointed time, Yahusha is going to do this. At this appointed time, Yahusha is going to do this. At this appointed time, Yahusha is going to do this. We know Yahuwah is an orderly God. This is why when you look at science, when you look at astronomy, when you look at mathematics, what do you notice about it? Very orderly. We would not have the laws of nature without Yahuwah God creating an orderly universe. Yahuwah God is God of order. And he has appointed times called the Moedim. And when Yahusha is assigned Savior, he has to carry out the Moedim for our salvation. Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits. When Yahusha carried out the Moedim, do you know what it became? The Moedim becomes what? When he carried out the Moedim, the first three, the first three um, uh, feasts, what happened? What do we have? The gospel. The gospel. When Yahusha carried out the first three Moedim, we have the beginning of the gospel. The gospel. What is the gospel? Let's read. Corinthians 15, 3 to 4. I pass on to you what most, what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said, here's Apostle Paul. When Yahushua was on earth, was he, an, was he an apostle? Apostle Paul? Was he called during the days of Yahushua on earth? No. He was called because he was persecuting the ecclesia, remember? And then he was called by Yahushua. When he was called by Yahushua, he became an apostle. 
And when he became an apostle, he learned about the Christian faith. You know where he learned about the Christian faith? By something called the creeds. You know what the creeds were? They were basically the creeds of faith of the followers of our king, Yahusha, before they were written down. They were passed on verbally. Because back then, many people were illiterate. They could not read. And so they passed on the message of the faith verbally. It's called a creed. And Apostle Paul, when he became converted, somebody gave him the creed. That's why he says, I passed on to you what was most important. What he received as the most important of the creeds, because there were many creeds. The most important creed of faith of the followers of our King Yahusha was this one. This is why I said it's the most important. It's what I received. Now it's what I want to pass on to you. What does the creed say? Three things, if you notice it, right? Number one, Christ died for our sins. Number two, he was buried. Number three, he was raised from the dead. Beloved brethren, when did he carry out these things? Death, burial, and resurrection? The Moedim, right? The Moedim. Because on Passover, Yahushua died. On the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he was buried. And on the third day, he appeared, resurrected. On the Feast of First Fruits, for that year when he died. And so we know our King Yahushua fulfilled the Moedim as the Savior. In fulfilling the Moedim, we now have the Gospel. What does it mean in the Gospel? Good news. We need to have faith in the good news. The good news is the expression of Yahuwah's love. His outstretched arm to embrace us and to bring us on to him. Self. This is why we need to rehearse the good news. We need to rehearse the Moedim. That's why we're here today. We're rehearsing the Moedim. But here's a question. I want you to think about this. Okay. Is there another way that we can also re rehearse the first three feasts? The spring feast of Yahuwah? Is there another way that we can do that? Is there any other way that we can rehearse the Moedim or the gospel of our King Yahushua? Yes. I'm going to read it to you next. And then as I read this, try to tell me why or how we can rehearse this as well. Let's read the book of Romans 6, 1 to 4. Well then, should we keep on sinning? So that God can show us more and more of this wonderful grace. Of course not. <laughs> not of course. Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Yahusha in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Isn't that amazing? How can we also rehearse the Moedim, the gospel? How can we show we have faith in the gospel and the work of our King Yahushua, showing that we believe he is the son of God who died for our sins? The Bible says, right, through baptism. Because when we're baptized, we join Yahushua on his death. When did he die? Passover. When we ba are baptized, we are rehearsing the death of our king, Yahusha. And so in baptism, we immerse an individual when they're baptized. We don't sprinkle the water. We have our brethren here who will be baptized soon. After this service is over, they're going to go to the baptismal waters, and they're going to be immersed. We're not going to sprinkle water on you. You're going to be immersed. Is that okay? Yeah? You're okay with that, right? I hope you understand. You're going to get wet. <laughs> You're going to be immersed. Why are you going to be immersed? That's because baptism is what? A burial. That's why we're immersed. When was Yahushua buried? Feast of unleavened bread. So we have Passover. We have Feast of unleavened bread. Now, when we immerse you in the water, you're going to get back up. You're not going to stay submerged for a long time. You're not going to stay submerged for three days. Don't worry about that. You're going you're gonna to get up right away. 
because Yahusha, when he was in, when he was buried, he rose back on the third day for so that we can have the power of salvation. This is why Yahusha, our king, was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father. That's what we call resurrection power, right? By the power of the hand of God, showing his outstretched arm, he raised Yahusha back to life. And so the hand of God, power, outstretched arm, love. He gave up his son to die, but he would resurrect him on the third day. And so when a person is baptized, what is he doing? He's rehearsing the first three Moedim, right? He's joining Yahusha in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Because when you get back up, what does Yahuwah God expect from you? Well, the Bible says now we may also live new lives. This is why the quest, the answer to the question, does it mean we can now keep on sinning? Yahushua died for our sins. Do we keep on sinning? No. We stop sinning the best we can. We die to sin. How can we continue living in it? When we were raised back to life, or when we were raised back from the water, Yahuwah God expects a different person. And so those who are getting baptized, you're going to get wet, yes. And after you come out of the water, you're going to look the same. You're going to look the same. Don't expect no more wrinkles or anything like that. You're going to look the same. Same wrinkles, right? Same person. But inwardly, you're going to be different. Inwardly, the Bible says you're going to be new. And there's something you're going to receive. And once you are baptized, once you come out of the water, the Bible tells us there's some expectation that he wants from you. What is that? Let's turn to the book of Romans 8, 10 to 11. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The spirit of God who raised Yahusha from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Yahusha from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Remember the hand of God? When Yahuwah delivered his people Israel from Egypt, what did he use again? His power, the hand of God, right? But the people of Israel still did not obey the covenant. And so Yahuwah God said, you know what? This covenant, there's something missing with this covenant. There's a fault in this covenant. What was the fault? The laws? What was that fault in this covenant? The people. Yahuwah God said, this is my covenant, but you cannot obey it. And so you fell. So I'm going to create another covenant. In this covenant, I'm going to give you the ability to carry out my laws. How so? The spirit. Before the hand of God was outside them. Before the power of God was outside them. Now what does Yahuwah God do with that power? He takes it from the outside and brings it where? Brings it inside you. Beloved brethren, within you is the spirit. Within you is the power of God. What power of God? The same power of God that resurrected who? Beloved brethren, that's the power, the hand, and the outstretched arm of Yahuwah. He gave you his spirit so that you can have power. And because you have this power of the Spirit of God, what does he expect from you now? Let's read 12 to 14. This is what it says. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And so according to Apostle Paul, Yahuwah and Yahusha give us the spirit, not so that we can break the law, but so that we can obey the law. This is why it's, I don't know why people say, we don't need to observe the Sabbath and things like that. Beloved brethren, those are the Ten Commandments. Yahuwah God gave us the ability to obey the Ten Commandments. And so no longer are we beholden to follow the dictates of our flesh. Bible says you can, you have the power to do something else now. You're different from other human beings all over the world. 
other human beings who don't have the spirit, you know what? They can't obey. They cannot be children of God. But you have the spirit of God now. So you can become my son. You can become my daughter. This is why we, that's the purpose of baptism. And so soon our brethren are going to receive the baptism, right? And we will baptize you in the name of the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. When we say the name of the Father, yeah, we use the, the name, but the, the word name or the, the term name represents also the authority, the power. Okay, so we will baptize you in the name of Yahuwah, Abba, in the name of Yahusha, Amashiah, and in the name of the Ruach Adash, or the Holy Spirit. And when we baptize you, those who are getting baptized, you need to have faith. Because if you're, if you're going to be baptized, but your baptism is not with faith, without faith, it's impossible to please God. This is why those who are getting baptized today, you need to show faith. You need to believe. When, you, when we say you're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you need to believe and understand what that represents. Because you can't believe the name unless you understand what it represents. And so how can a person show faith? How can they be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? We're almost done. The book of Acts 2.38. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Number one. And be baptized in the name of Yahusha Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Number two. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Number three. We're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What does it mean? That we are baptized in the name of Yahuwah Abba. Yahuwah. Because of his love. Because of his name. Stretched out his arm. And with his power. He gave us the ability to turn to him. Or to return to him. Despite our sins. Because he sent his only begotten son. We need to repent. To turn to God. Now we can turn to God. Differently from the way it was done the Old Testament times. Back then, you could not go through the most holy place. Now you can, <laughs> by the authority of who? Yahuwah. You need to have faith in that, that. That Yahuwah gave us the means by which we can approach him, turn to him, be with him, because of his sacrifice. How can we, let's go back to Acts 2.38, how can we be baptized in the name of Yahusha? Bible says, baptized in the name of Yahusha Christ for the forgiveness of your since you need to have faith that Yahushua died, was buried, resurrected for the forgiveness of our, of our sins. You need to have faith in that. What else? We also need to have faith that we receive. We will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so by faith, accept the gift of Yahuwah. By faith, accept the sacrifice of Yahushua. By faith, accept the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you're baptized, you will receive all of those things. And this is the purpose of our baptism. Baptism expresses to us and tells us that Yahuwah's outstretched arms is being manifested. Yahuwah's love is being manifested. Yahusha's love is being manifested. And because we receive the Spirit of God, what does that mean? We're almost done. Romans 8, 15, 15 to 17. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are, we, we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Beloved brethren, when we receive the Spirit of God, because we, because of our faith, Bible says we become what? What do we become? Children of God. Do you believe that you're children of God? If we're children of God, what does that mean? We're heirs. We are heirs. What does it mean that we are heirs? We're going to receive. Together with the firstborn, Yahushua HaMashiach, everlasting life. That is what is in store for each one of us. The glory of God 
But before we can get to the glory of God, the Bible says we have to also share in what? Don't be surprised that we have to endure sufferings. Being one with Yahusha in baptism doesn't mean the sufferings are going to be gone. No. It only means when the suffering is there, the strength, and the power, and the love is also present. That's what we need to realize when we celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Long ago, Yahuwah God delivered his people Israel from bondage of Egypt. But Yahuwah's son, Yahusha, delivers us from sin and the consequences of sin so that we can be heirs forevermore. And because of this, there's something that we can do that was unheard of, unheard of during the days of Moses. During the days of Moses, yeah, the prophets recognized God as father, but they never called him what? They never called him what? You know, in the Greek, I went, I went to check it out. And this is how it is in the Greek. What's the Greek word for Abba? Abba. The translators couldn't find a proper word that means Abba. So they kept the actual word. Father in Greek is pater. Sounds like father, doesn't it? The Bible says if you have the spirit of God, not only do you have God as your father, there's a word that has no equivalent in English. It's called what? Abba. Abba is a Greek term. Abba is what we can call. God. Do you know what the difference is between Abba and Father? They're closely related. What's the difference between Abba and Father? When you use the term Abba, you do so within the context of a very close and intimate relationship, like Papa or Daddy, right? In other words, what our God is doing is when he says by his outstretched arm, he's basically telling all of us, come, come to me. I am your Abba. That's why he says, don't be fearful slaves. Don't be fearful slaves. When they left Egypt, they should not have been slaves anymore. Don't go back to slavery. Don't. You're an heir, brethren. You are the sons and daughters of God. You can call him Abba. Abba, Yahuwah. That's who he is to us now. During our time, this was a big breakthrough. Because before that, nobody would call him Abba. He says, call him Abba. We can call him Abba. He wants us to draw near him. And because he is our Abba, and he wants us to develop a relationship with him, what does he want us to do? We're almost done. Just two more verses. Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that one, that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit. So we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. Apostle Paul is telling us two individuals can be close to each other or intimate with each other when both people know each other's thoughts. The person we're closest with should be our spouse, but there are still limitations to how we can really know even our spouse. But beloved brethren, what Yahuwah God invites us to do is to be close to him, so much so he will know our thoughts and then we will know his thoughts. The sharing of innermost thoughts, that's what the relationship is all about. And it's mind-boggling, really, when Yahuwah decides and says to us, with open arms, come, learn from me, learn my thoughts, learn my character, learn who I am. You see, God is a relatable God. He wants us to relate to him. We should not think of God as some abstract idea. 
some statue. Yehovah God wants us to know him at a deep and personal level. Because he is Yahuwah, our Abba. And as our Abba, whenever we go through sufferings in life, when we go through tribulations in life, because we know before we partake of the glory, we have to first share in the, in the sufferings. What does Yahuwah want us to do when we're going through some difficult time right now? Let's read the final passage of our studies today. Romans 8. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are. For we do not know how we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. And God who sees into our hearts knows what the thought of the Spirit is. Because the Spirit pleads with God on behalf of his people and in accordance with his will. Sometimes when we pray to God, we don't even know what to say. Sometimes when we are beset by sorrows and problems one after the other, we don't know what to say. When we feel weak and sometimes when we are ashamed or even afraid to pray to him. The Bible says, don't forget who you are. You are his children. God is your Abba now. A father who has children and he loves his children. The children know no matter what they did, no matter how bad it was, they know, they know. They can always approach their loving father. But Yahusha said something remarkable. Even human fathers who love their children, they're not perfect. But God, he's perfect. He's perfect. And his love for you is perfect. Do not ever say to yourself, my sins, because of my sins, Yahuwah God will no longer listen to me. Don't think too highly of yourself. Beloved brethren, Yahuwah already gave up his son. What do you want to convince you to go to him with his outstretched arms? He opens himself to all of us. Why not go to him? Even when you're weak, he prayed. Never stop praying. Even when all you can do is cry, let the tears be the prayer. Because the Bible says the spirit, he will plead with God for us and groans at words cannot express. Did you know? Bible tells us there are two things God collects in heaven. Two things God collects in heaven. Revelation 8, Psalm 56. Two things God collects in heaven. Number one, he collects our prayers. He collects our prayers. For some reason, he has ordained prayer to achieve his purposes here on earth. Prayer works. Prayer matters, so do not stop praying. Even when we're weak, keep praying. Pray. Always pray. If you're praying for someone, if you're praying for your children, if you're praying for your sickness, if you're praying for your livelihood, do not pray. Every time you pray, you send it up to heaven. God collects it. That's number one. Number two, God also collects our tears. Not only does he collect our tears, he puts them in his bottle. Because there's a purpose for every suffering. And the, there's a purpose for every tear. And he will show that to us when we are with him. For now, while we wait for that day, keep in mind, never forget who you are. You are a son and daughter of God. Call him Abba. Abba, Yahuwah. That is what we celebrate. The hand of God with his outstretched arm sending forth his son so that we can receive his embrace and be with him forevermore. Let us stand, brethren. We shall pray. Everlasting Father, Yahuwah, 
our Abba. You are so good, so kind, to the point when we are perplexed sometimes. Because as human beings, we have become so judgmental. Often we judge ourselves and deem ourselves unworthy. For we are true sinners before you. But Father, you are Yahuwah. With your outstretched arm, you manifested your love. You sent your son, though we did not deserve him. Though we did not deserve your act of kindness. You did so anyways. You say it is grace. You say it is love. We believe you, Abba. You are God of love. Thank you for blessing us today. Reminding us of who we are. We are your sons. We are your daughters. Father, day by day, night by night, you have heard the groans of your people. You have heard the prayers from our hearts. We pray for our children. We pray for our loved ones. We pray for our health and our faith. Father, we know you collect our prayers. Help us to work harder, to believe more. But may our belief be based upon your goodness, upon your love, one who gives even when we do not deserve. Thank you, Father, for you have blessed our occasion today. Soon, Abba, some of your servants will be immersed in the baptism. Bless the waters. May it represent the burial of King Yahushua. Yeah. When they are immersed into the water, give them the gift of your Holy Spirit, the forgiveness of sins, and the opportunity to belong to you, to be embraced by your gracious arms. Father, please bless them that they will never forget this day, the day when you took them in to belong to you forevermore. Our King Yahushua, Yahushua, our Savior, Messiah, thank you for your grace and love. Thank you for healing us. Thank you for providing for us. We love you so much. We cannot wait to see your face because on that day of your appearing, we will rush to you. We will embrace you. No one and nothing will stop us. We will go after you. Even now, O oh King, we carry your cross, your cross. We will share in your sufferings for we love you so much. And remember what you have done for all of us. We ask and beg of you. Again, perform your miracle. Heal those who are sick. Strengthen the, the, the faith of the weak. And bless us with many more opportunities to worship like this. Father, thank you for listening to our prayers. We believe that you have listened to our petitions. For we ask and beg everything in the name of our Lord and Savior. Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen. Us unfailing love and tender mercies overshadow us. The grace and power of Yahushua HaMashiach strengthen us, and the constant companionship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us now and forevermore. Amen. Uh, beloved brethren, uh, just a few reminders. We have two. Number one, uh, tomorrow is our first fruits celebration, right? So tomorrow we have a convocation. 
at 10 o'clock a.m. Pacific Standard Time, which would conclude our spring feast. I think you all know what happened on first fruits of the year um, with our King Yahusha died, because this year is different, right? It's always different. It changes every year. You notice the calendar, the Hebrew calendar is based on the moon and the sun, use the sun and the moon. But with our Gregorian calendar, it doesn't follow the, the, the model that the Bible gives us. And so it's always changing, right? And so it's not always going to be March 31st. It's always going to be different. Anyways, uh, tomorrow we will celebrate first fruits and this corresponds to the resurrection of our King, uh, Yahusha. Lastly, let's not forget, uh, brethren, those who are interested, this is something fun, right? Those who want to join us for our Alaskan cruise, uh, we would be happy to have you. And so the theme of our Bible studies while on the ship is the awe of God, the awesome power of God. And so we want to experience uh, the awe of our Father, Yahuwah. And so it would be fun to have you join us. You know, we're maybe even outdoors. We can look at the stars, um, the moon, <laughs> the fish, <laughs> sardines, what, what, the lights. Yeah. And then we get to eat what we saw. I'm not <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but we get to, you know, um, have fun. And I know every time we have a get together, it's always fun. And we talk about the Bible, right? So can you imagine her in the ship? We're kind of stuck together and we're talking about the Bible. That's really edifying. You know, you can ask me any question you want while we're eating. We can talk about the Bible, talk about prophecy. We can talk about, you know, what you've experienced. And so it's an edifying moment for all of us. Um, this is from October the 6th to October the 13th. Um, there are several already who have confirmed, uh, but we still have availability. Uh, but the deadline is, Brother Paul, April the 1st. If you, have, if you have any questions, Brother Paul is the one in charge, right? So if you have any questions about this, Brother Paul can give you all the answers you need. But April 1st is the deadline, So hope, which is how many days away from now? Two days? Two days, yeah. So you have until April the 1st if you want to join us in the seven-day cruise. We do hope that you will, but if you can't, uh, it's okay. We're going to broadcast after the Bible studies that we have, that we, we will be doing. Okay, that is all. And Yahushua Abba and Yahushua Hamashiach bless all of us.